Hi, and welcome back to STS 1451. Today we are going to be talking about sex, gender, and medicine. Keywords, concepts, and names from today include drug trials, sex disaggregated data, patriarchy, historical gendering of medicine, the women's health movement, feminist pedagogy, mater maternal mortality, mortality gap, the Heckler Report, weathering, elastic load, Black Women's Health Study, and Margaret Heckler. All of these terms were in our readings for today. Where does sex or gender fit? You might be asking yourself, why have a whole day of our really short class devoted to these issues? If that question occurred to you, I would ask in response, why did you think that gender or sex was unimportant? Why did Perez, Sharma, and Roder see gender and intersectionally race as crucial aspects of study? We've already discussed how the medical profession became homogenized by the Flexner Report in 1910. Margaret M. Heckler, Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services, created a task force to study disproportionality in medicine. The document they published is now colloquially called the Heckler Report, and Rhoda discusses it in her piece from today's reading. The Heckler Report came out in 1985. Here are some excerpts from the front matter, a letter um, that Heckler herself wrote at the beginning of the report. In January 1984, 10 months after becoming the Secretary of Health and Human Services, I sent Health United States 1983 to the Congress. It was the annual report card of the health status of the American people. That report, like its predecessors, documented significant progress. Americans were living longer, infant mortality had continued to decline, the overall American health picture showed almost uniform improvement. But, and that but signaled a sad and significant fact, there was a continuing disparity in the burden of death and illness experienced by Blacks and other minority Americans as compared with our nation's population as a whole. That disparity has existed ever since accurate federal, federal record keeping began more than a generation ago. And although our health charts do itemize study gains and health status of minority Americans, the stubborn disparity remained an affront to both to our ideals and to the ongoing genius of American medicine. I felt passionately that it was time to decipher the message inherent in that disparity. This is a pretty impressive letter um, from a medical professional because you see here that she is appealing to emotion. I felt passionately, the pathos. In addition to the logic, um, this is undermining our ideals and our genius to have this health disparity here. This is from page two of the report itself. Although tremendous strides have been made in improving the health and longevity of the American people, statistical trends show a persistent distressing disparity in key health indicators among certain subgroups of the population. In 1983, life expectancy reached a new high of 75.2 years for whites and 69.6 years for blacks, a gap of 5.6 years. Nevertheless, Blacks today have a life expectancy already reached by whites in the early 1950s or a lag of about 30 years. Infant mortality rates have fallen steadily for several decades for both Blacks and Whites. In 1960, Blacks suffered 44.3 infant deaths for every 1,000 live births, roughly twice the rates for Whites, 22.9. Moreover, in 1981, Blacks suffered 20 infant deaths per 1,000 live births, still twice the white level of 10.5, but similar to the white rate of 1960. The task force on Black and minority health was thus conceived in response to a national paradox of phenomenal scientific achievement and steady improvement in overall health status, while at the same time, persistent significant health inequities exist for minority Americans. So she considers this a paradox. Our readings from last Friday when we first started talking about race and medicine would suggest that it's actually built into the medical system, but that's not from Heckler's perspective. I'll, uh, uh, Back to her quote, as the task force came into being in April 1984, it was evident that to bring the health of minorities to the level of all Americans, efforts of monumental proportions were needed. So this was an important report, just like the Flexner report sought to standardize everything and put in the laboratory paradigm, Heckler wants to standardize everything so that all Americans get equitable treatment in medical institutions, an ideal that still 40 years later almost we haven't reached. According to Roeder's article, America is Failing Its Black Mothers, as Linda Blount, the Black Women's Health Imperative, 
noted during the Morehouse Symposium, quote, race is not a risk factor. It is a lived experience of being a black woman in the society that is the risk factor. So one of the really important things that I want you to take away from this lecture and our reading so far is that when you have the kind of disproportionate numbers, and this is something Heckler knew and why she created the study that she did, you have to realize that it's a problem in care and it's a problem at the socio-cultural level and not just a problem that's inherent in the bodies of the people who are suffering more. This is an issue we'll come back to when we get to disability activism as well. So how does this relate to previous readings? Why do you think we've developed the data gaps that Caroline Criado Perez mentions? Where do the gaps in our knowledge come from? Malika Sharma doesn't use the word universalism in her study, but thinks about how the shift towards universalism plays a role in our answer to this question. When we moved from natural to norms, which bodies became the norms we were measured against? Both Perez and Sharma can help you answer this question. It's pretty apparent, especially in Perez's book, Invisible Women, which I, I really do recommend the whole book if you're interested and you like that excerpt. I, I gave you the piece she has about medicine, but she looks at these data gaps in many aspects of society. Um, when white men function as the norm and you have this uh, universalist idea that they can stand in for other people, there are a lot of dangerous things that you don't see, like the way that a heart attack looks really different for women than men, and how representations of heart attacks on TV that are based on the way that uh, men tend to suffer heart attacks leave women not knowing what's happening to them if they're having a cardiac event. That's just one example. Intersectionality. Roder's piece focuses on the intersectional question of Black women in medicine. How does it complement or extend our discussion of race in medicine? So thinking back to our discussion of the uh, Tuskegee syphilis study and our readings from that day, is there a place for thinking about gender and sex in those articles? What happens when we start to ask those questions and make gender and sex visible to try to avoid the invisibility that Caroline Criado Perez talks about? Another point of intersectionality. This is Robert A. Tom's painting from the Great Moments in Medicine series, and it shows James Marion Sims interacting with a Black woman patient. Sims famously experimented on Black women without anesthesia because he believed that they did not experience pain. He has been quoted saying that in a lot of different places, if you want to look it up. He went on to become a famous surgeon to the point that his cruel experiments could be titled A Great Moment in Medicine at one time. As our readings from today show, attending to gender and its intersections with race help us be more effective in every aspect of medicine from drug trials to medical education. Looking back at this picture, how can somebody who's actually experimenting on a person and seeing them suffer still think that they don't believe in pain? That bias superseded any faith in universalism or scientific medicine, and it's built into our medical system in ways that we've already read about uh, have cascading effects with the way that Black Americans might rightfully distrust the medical establishment to the way that the medical establishment has trouble accounting for and taking care of bodies that are different from the norm that's based on the white male body, as we've seen in our literature. So if we want to be more intersectional in our approach, the same applies to the historian of medicine. It's our duty to recognize the extent to which medical knowledge is shaped by pain, exploitation, and erasure. By shining a light on these historical and present situations, we can create the conditions for a more equitable and effective medical culture in the future. So we are basically looking at medicine, trying to see what they're missing, how we can make it better, and hoping that will affect the change that Margaret Heckler set out to see when she wanted to create an equitable medical system with her Heckler report in 1985. For next time, we'll be reading about the breast cancer industry and other ancillary industries that shape the experience of medicine. Some of these have obvious gendered and racialized components. Sometimes we have to think analytically to make those connections. So our reading from Kelly Joyce, Magnetic Appeal, another really good book, um, isn't obviously about race or gender, but I, you could still think about those things as you're reading them. Notice that our lectures and readings are getting shorter. That's because I know you're focusing on your papers now, so I'm, I'm trying to back up a little bit to give you time to do your own work. 
but I look forward to seeing what you write and I hope that you enjoyed this lecture.